Good morning and welcome to this uh, evidence session for the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Uh, the Committee on Standards in Public Life is independent of government, but it advises the Prime Minister and the government of the day on processes and systems to uphold high ethical standards across the whole of British public life. Uh, for the 25th anniversary of the first report of this committee, we undertook a piece of academic work to map the tapestry of standards bodies that uh, enforce or uphold public standards uh, and to understand where there might be gaps and where there might be overlaps. And the purpose of our current inquiry is to establish whether the current arrangements are working as well as they might, to establish where there might be areas for improvement and then for to come forward with recommendations and best practice guidance. Uh, we're delighted to have with us this morning, Lord Sedwill, the former cabinet secretary and national security advisor, uh, and a full house of our committee, uh, both the independent members and also uh, representing political parties. So we have with us Dame Shirley Pearson, independent member, Dr. Jane Martin, independent member, uh, Manisha Shah, an independent member, uh, and then, in addition, uh, Margaret Beckett, MP, uh, representing the Labour Party, Jeremy Wright, uh, MP, Conservative, and Lord Stunnell from the Liberal Democrats. Uh, this will be a live stream uh, going out on our YouTube channel. Uh, and just to remind anybody who is watching for the first time that we are not looking at casework uh, or at cases that are currently uh, before the courts, but to understand the context and the systems underlying British public standards. Uh, so I think without more ado, we will move into our evidence session. Uh, and perhaps I could start, Lord Sedwell, by asking, from your perspective, how important is it for British public life that there should be clear and high ethical standards? Well, Lord Evans, good morning and good morning to the committee. And thank you for the uh, invitation to attend. And I know one of my distinguished predecessors, Gus O'Donnell, is giving evidence uh, to you later uh, later today as well. And um, just on uh, on that first question, I think it's absolutely vital. It's it's uh, key domestically uh, into maintaining uh, the high levels of public confidence in our entire government's system. Uh, people sometimes look at opinion polls that look at levels of public trust in different professions. Um, politicians and journalists often don't come out uh, terribly well by comparison. But the truth is that actually the public do trust our governance system trust in civil servants, trust in professionals in public life are, are, are very high. And it is critical to maintaining essentially consent for the democratic system, particularly when uh, the political system is taking controversial decisions that people essentially accept that the, um, that the, that the system itself maintains uh, high standards and the participants do too. Also, uh, you probably uh, have any cabinet secretary uh, 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 make uh, that point. Um, but there's also a point I'd like to make just as a former national security advisor. And Lord Evans, you're all familiar with this, again, from your uh, work in that area. Um, Dame Margaret, too, as chair of the committee. It's an important part of our brand worldwide. Uh, uh, that's not only for political reasons and part of the soft power of the UK worldwide. And that, of course, is an important part of the UK's uh, international reputation, but part of our economic um, 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 strength is that um, uh, overseas investors, overseas businesses, exporters, etc., can be confident that by coming to the UK, that uh, it is not only a good place to do business, it's a safe place to do business. And part of that is about the regulatory standards in our financial system and so on and so forth, our business systems. Uh, part of it, though, is about predictability in our political and governance system and knowing that in the end, the rules will apply equally to everyone. So I think it's a, particularly now that we're in, we are uh, having to uh, cut a more independent position in the world post Brexit, it is critically important that governance um, is seen as part of our comparative economic advantage as well as our uh, global reputation. Thank you very much. And we will be talking to some very senior business people as part of this inquiry in order to uh, elaborate on that theme, which I think is very important. Um, is ethical, do ethical standards matter in terms of decision making or merely in terms of trust and reputation? So in making decisions, 
Uh, how far do you believe that ethical standards are relevant to the decision and policy process? I, mean, I think fundamentally that is an issue for the politicians, the ministers who make the decisions, and of course the parliament who scrutinise and are involved in some of those decisions. You know, ethical issues are not always completely straightforward. There are often uh, different views on uh, the, the correct uh, ethical stance, or particularly on a very complex uh, political issue. And I think as professionals within the civil service, the wider public service, we um, generally regard those as decisions that, that ministers have to balance off against uh, uh, all the other uh, issues that they face. Now, of course, there are um, uh, areas of public life where there are exceptions. We have ethics bodies in particular in considering um, uh, uh, in, in the medical uh, and health, uh, public health uh, area, uh, which are governed by uh, professionals with deep experience in those areas. And uh, there are clearly other areas where one could consider that. But fundamentally, and I think you know, the, 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 the former ministers on your panel would have a perspective on this, I think politicians need to, and ministers need to address the ethical questions alongside all of the other considerations uh, that they um, have to uh, consider when making the big uh, decisions and part of the job of the professional civil service is to ensure those issues are exposed to ministers um, but uh, clearly in, in the end in most cases um, uh, those remain issues for ministers to judge. Over the last 12 months obviously the uh, arguably maybe the last 18 months the system has been under very acute stress uh, because of external factors and one or two internal factors um, do you think that in adherence to ethical standards has been affected by this period of acute crisis and pressure? I think there's a, uh, I think there's a deception here, uh, sorry, a, a, a difference here between perception and, uh, 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 and actually some of the underlying reality. In practice, I don't think I've seen um, uh, any uh, uh, difference or indeed weakening of the commitment of public servants, whether those are political or professional, because I regard politicians as public servants uh, uh, too, um, uh, to the overall commitment to high ethics in government and uh, uh, to the standards that apply. Um, now, of course, we've been through a polarized period politically, and therefore there has been, um, uh, there have been more accusations about personal conduct the neutrality of the civil service, et cetera, et cetera, which of course are important issues of principle uh, as well. But actually, I think uh, notwithstanding that, it's held up, um, it, it's held up um, uh, just as I would expect. Um, uh, and I've seen no actual uh, dilution of that commitment, uh, notwithstanding the accusations that are sometimes uh, leveled against the system as a whole or indeed individuals within it. But that's very interesting because there, there have been quite a lot of suggestions that, for instance, corners will cut on some procurement things, that some of the behaviours that have been exhibited were not up to the levels that you know, might traditionally have been expected. But from your perspective, those are not held, not borne out by the facts? Well, I, um, uh, uh, I mean, in a crisis, you do sometimes have to cut through the, um, the normal governance uh, procedures. But we have ways of doing that that ensure that they are properly transparent. Now, they may well, it may well turn out that there were decisions taken that on reflection, if the NEO or the PAC look at them, they consider that actually the, uh, the decision to, to, to cut through the normal process, set, a, set aside the normal process, wasn't uh, justified, not only with hindsight, but even uh, uh, known at the time. Um, and of course, a part of the strength of our system is, ex is that we have those independent bodies, the NAO, the PAC, et cetera, who can look at it and say, this wasn't, this wasn't right. Um, this corner should not have been cut. This, um, uh, this particular procedure should not have been set aside. But I think as long as um, uh, there's transparency around that, as long as um, the civil service has been uh, advising ministers of the pros and cons and the risks, as well as the potential benefits of it, as long as when it's necessary, a permanent secretary and accounting officer gets a formal direction from ministers to set aside a particular procedure that as accounting officers they would normally expect to be adhered to, then we maintain accountability in the system. And the system has to be able to respond to crises. The key thing is, it, is, is, is it responding in a transparent and accountable way? Um, and I haven't seen evidence to suggest, um, really hard evidence to suggest that it hasn't, but of course that in, a sense, in the end is something I'm sure that the PAC, the NEO and other bodies will look at in due course. 
Thank you. Um, we have a, obviously the seven principles of public life, which this committee are very, uh, very much sort of focused on because of the history. Um, and there are a variety of codes of conduct and um, uh, uh, systems within government, which appear to be quite overlapping. Do you feel that these fit together as a satisfactory whole when you look at, for instance, the ministerial code, the various parliamentary conduct codes, the civil service code, etc.? I think uh, there is always a good case for, uh, at the risk of sounding trite, codification of the codes. I mean, you're right, uh, Lord Evans, that there are some overlaps and some of the boundaries mean inevitably in the different jurisdictions mean that they aren't always completely consistent. But I think the underlying principles are clear, the Nolan principles as you, as you just uh, referred to. Um, and um, uh, uh, I mean, just as one of the things I uh, had hoped to have uh, the time to do, but events crowded out, was to update the cabinet manual. I know you may want to ask some points about that um, later on in the session. Um, uh, and I'm sure uh, the, the various codes would benefit from some rationalization. I don't think we should think that the answer uh, here is in the uh, uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of the codes. The, the answer is in everyone in public life recognising those underlying principles and behaving accordingly. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Jane Martin now. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Lord Sedwell. Good morning. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to uh, probe a little more about the effectiveness of standards regulation across government. Um, and you already touched on some of the issues, actually, in your, in your opening remarks. But um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to just perhaps tell us a bit more, uh, very much from your kind of frontline practice and experience, of course. Uh, so uh, I'm asking that question, particularly thinking of, uh, you know, in your view, does it feel like across government that um, standards regulation is regarded as a matter of compliance uh, as opposed to embodying the values of public service? And also particularly interested in the tension, or I would ask, is there a tension, um, you know, between leading and promoting ethical standards in a political context, which is different from elsewhere? And if so, if you agree with that, you know, what kind of, uh, what do you observe and what do you think might need to be changed as a result? Um, uh, well, thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, uh, I mean, I think on your on your first point, in a sense, the answer is is both. It is a matter of compliance because, of course, any uh, any regime of standards needs to have some teeth as well as essentially um, the, uh, the the encouragement and example of people essentially uh, believing um, because of their own. Uh, uh, principles and the, the fact they've chosen a life of public service to observe the uh, the Nolan principles and and uh, the general uh, good conduct of government and and public service. So it it has to be uh, it has to be both. Um, but uh, I would certainly put the emphasis myself on embedding um, the, the the principles themselves in the conduct of government, in the training of people uh, coming into. Public service, and by the way, I don't just mean the civil service, uh, or indeed uh, parliament and government. There, I mean the entire public service, because these standards, of course, although often described differently, would apply just as much across the NHS um, or the police or fire service uh, as they would in the in the core civil service, expressed differently and with different emphasis, but fundamentally many of the same um, underlying principles apply. Um, and it's really important that as we recruit people, as we train them, as we coach them, as we report on them, that we are maintaining um, this, uh, this lens. Alongside that, of course, there, do, there does have to be a, an effective compliance mechanism. I know you'll probably want to ask some further uh, points about that. I don't actually think, to go to your second point, it is more complex in the political environment. I'm now, uh, as you know, making a transition into the private sector, or at least partly into the private sector. And one of the things I'm really struck by there is the degree to which what in the private sector is referred to as ESG, environment, social governance issues, are heading right up the agenda in the governance of private sector uh, companies with shareholders uh, much more active on this, um, boards um, under much more scrutiny. And in a sense, the private sector, I think, is now um, uh, 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 moving to the same point we've always had in the political system of recognising that uh, standards, uh, commitment to broader uh, social and economic uh, goals uh, is an important part of 
uh, their social responsibility as well as um, uh, uh, as well as if you like the bottom line. Now, many companies have always done that, and and it is complex, of course. Uh, but I think um, I, I think in some ways we're seeing a convergence between the, the private and public, the private sector and the public service, um, uh, in a way that perhaps we haven't seen before. I see. Um, I, I, I just like to come back to you on, on the sort of the you described it as ministers having to um, make balanced judgments, for example, in relation to decisions and how the advice from civil senior civil servants was very important in order that ethical issues are properly considered uh, and applied. Um, I, but I'm thinking, let, let's say, you know, that the prime minister or minister has the democratic right to govern. Uh, you know, they are the elected representatives of the people. Uh, and so when I talk about attention, I'm just wondering whether, in your view, you, you feel that um, we are approaching instances where we believe elected officials in government are contributing ethical standards. Are we approaching that in the right way? Uh, bearing in mind, as you've also said, that we seem to be going through a period of more polarised politics. I think, uh, I mean, of course, the rules of any democratic system are not just that the elected ministers um, uh, have a mandate and therefore um, uh, can govern, you, you, that, that uh, the protection of the minority, um, the rule of law, uh, adherence to standards more generally, of course, are important, um, uh, set important boundaries around the right of any, in any political system, of, of uh, certainly democratic system, um, with checks and balances, of the exercise of democratic uh, responsibility. And of course, it is an important part of the civil services job is to be able to bring to ministers' attention the those boundary issues. We're having a former attorney general on the panel, um, who I'm sure would have seen it as part of his job, and indeed I can recall without wishing to breach the um, sanctity of the law officer's uh, role, but he, I can certainly think of occasions on which he spoke in uh, cabinet meetings or cabinet subcommittee meetings to remind colleagues of exactly where the boundaries uh, lay, um, uh, what was um, a, a matter of uh, lawfulness versus what was a uh, matter of broader public policy or other standards and exactly where those boundaries lay. That's all part of the, uh, that's all part of the system. And some of those boundaries cannot be crossed. Ministers cannot make unlawful decisions. Um, uh, uh, other boundaries, uh, 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 other boundaries are um, subject to ministers to uh, reach a, a, a mature consideration. And yes. The key to that is that those decisions are um, uh, are accountable, uh, accountable to Parliament or accountable ultimately to the public. Sure, uh, but uh, I mean, there had, does seem to have been increasing pressure across the board on standards in government recently. Uh, I mean, do, what, what, how would you describe that? Is that a trend, or is that just you know different governments facing different challenges? Um, I think um, uh, there's, been, there's there's certainly been more public scrutiny of certain elements of it, but I'm not sure that. Um, uh, I'm not sure it's right to describe it as a trend. You know, I think back to you know, when I was leaving school and going to university, the enormous controversy around the Belgrano affair during the Falklands War. You know, that was, a, uh, that was a, a, a matter of very great uh, public and political controversy. There were all sorts of questions about whether it was the right decision, whether it was transparent, um, uh, was the evidence that was shared with the public appropriate, etc. And one can think of other instances, certainly over the course of my adult life, um, uh, 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 issue, issues and examples of that kind. So I, I'm not sure that I, 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 I perceive a trend. There are clearly issues, you, I know you aren't looking at individual cases, no. there are clearly issues that I'm sure the committee will want to refer to, which have um, had a high public profile and which have been controversial over the past few years, either broad policy questions, such as the uh, controversies uh, uh, around some elements of the Brexit settlement and the uh, and the treaty with the EU, or relating more to uh, application of the ministerial code and so on. Um, I, I don't know that I would perceive a particular trend uh, there. I think these things sometimes go in cycles, and I can think of a lot of controversies, for example, at the end of the uh, 1990s, around the behaviour of MPs and the behaviour of ministers and so on, uh, that fortunately we haven't seen you know, cash for questions and things like that. We haven't seen recently, so we mustn't have... Our memories mustn't be too short about these things. I think we reckon we have to recognise issues of this kind have always arisen in a political system. And actually, one of the benefits of our system is, in the end, they come out and uh, people are held accountable for them. Uh, 
Thank you. And just finally for me, uh, I mean, you, you've, you have talked a lot about the important relationship of, um, you know, law officers, uh, senior civil servants uh, it, working with politicians. Uh, and you've talked about embodying, you know, uh, public service values as well as uh, adhering, you know, in a compliant way. To what extent is this a question of political leadership, you know, as well as the leadership from officials? Um, it, it, it has to be. Um... Um, because in the end, of course, more than anyone else, uh, political leadership sets the tone for the, uh, the way the whole of government uh, approaches these issues. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't by that just mean ministers. So that is parliament as well. And I can think of episodes during uh, the, the, the Brexit period where um, uh, you, on both sides of that argument, um, some... Uh, should we say controversial tactics, even within Parliament, were being used uh, in order to advance the particular uh, approach that, it, that that people were taking. So uh, it comes; it has to start in a democratic system. It has to start with the the political class as a whole, if you like. Um, uh, ministers, of course, are are, are the most visible um, uh, uh, spokespeople uh, of that uh, of that group. Uh, but it's a responsibility for all of us um, in public service. Thank you very much indeed. I, th I think Jeremy Wright is uh, going to be asking some questions next. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Martin. Uh, thanks, Jane. Good morning, all. Well, can I uh, ask you a bit about the, the balance between rules and conventions in our system of ethics and standards regulation? You've talked already about the answer to our problems not likely being entirely found in the details of the codes of conduct and similar. But do you think that we've got the balance right in our system between those things that are unwritten rules, conventions of conduct, and those things that are more formal rules subject to enforcement? And would you change that balance in any way? Well, I'm a, I'm a believer in conventions because I think they um, more, uh, uh, um, uh, there are more agile and flexible way of reflecting the underlying principles that are most important. Uh, but if it turns out that people are not observing those conventions, the unwritten rules, as you, as you put it, Mr. Wright, then of course, um, it may be necessary to start writing down more and more of the rules. But the reason I'm, I'm cautious about uh, saying that we should, we should definitively move in that direction is I look at the example of the United States and there you have a highly elaborate written constitution with more precedent, case law, um, more rules, um, probably in detail than you know, almost any, uh, anywhere else within the democratic world compared to the, essentially the largely convention-based approach and principles-based approach that we've taken here. And even there, we see that actually sitting behind those rules are a whole range of conventions relating to political behavior that if just disregarded can um, uh, cause very real uh, problems. And we've, you know, we saw that, um, for example, in you know, accepting the outcome of an election, to use the most stark example, but I can think of others over the previous um, uh, period uh, as well. So even the most elaborate rules-based systems rely upon uh, behavior and conventions to enable them to function effectively. Um, and so, so I think if, if we're going to, if we, if we consider that there's a need to sharpen up uh, the rules in any particular area, we also need to ask ourselves why that is the case and why the underlying principles and conventions no longer appear uh, adequate. What, you know, what, it is, what is it in, in behavior or attitude that has changed uh, to mean that uh, that's no longer the, uh, an, adequate, uh, 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 an adequate response in, in whichever area it might be? And presumably that there's a connection between what you've just said and your sense that broadly speaking, the current system that we have is being properly observed and broadly speaking, standards are high. But where there are failures, do you think those are failures because people do not fully understand the conventions to which they are subject or ought to be subject or that they do understand them but simply don't believe that they are going to be enforceable and therefore they won't follow them? Um, uh, I'm sure there are elements of, of, of both in that, as your own experience would probably tell you. I think, broadly speaking, um, people do understand the conventions, not least because 
in a way, they, they, they codify what, you, what most of us would understand to be um, uh, um, acceptable uh, human behaviour in any uh, institution, that you, you should um, um, you know, be honest, you should apply integrity, you should be selfless in your decisions, uh, you should govern in the interests of all, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think in most cases it's understanding. Sometimes that is one of the issues about very detailed rules. People might actually you know, not understand the exact uh, detail of a particular uh, uh, of a particular issue. I think, to be honest, part of this is that in a period when um, uh, when, when politics has become somewhat polarised, or the really big sort of questions of national identity, and one can think of the uh, not only the 2016 but the 2014 referendum um, creating similar issues in the in, for example, in the Scottish political system as we saw more generally, then you can have um, some people believing that. Um, the, the, the question of the day is so important, it overrides um, some of the underlying previous conventions. Um, and that, I think, is when the tensions uh, can become uh, really significant. Thank you. And, and last, last question, which is too tempting not to ask. You mentioned that you'd not have the opportunity to uh, update or revise the Cabinet Manual, which, of course, is one way in which we might encode some of these thoughts and rules. What would you have done, given the opportunity? So I think, uh, I mean, I certainly would have uh, revised and updated it. I mean, partly, actually, um, because there are several areas which I think uh, need to be uh, uh, need to be altered in the in the in the policy areas. I mean, for example, in um, uh, as you may as you will recall, the parliamentary scrutiny of um, ministerial decisions on some areas of national security, for example, where the cabinet manual. Um, isn't uh, it doesn't fully reflect uh, subsequent practice, uh, but I think bringing together to go to the earlier point I think Lord Evans was was uh, making about sort of codifying the codes, if I can put it in that uh, way, I think the cabinet manual is a good uh, place uh, in which to do that, and therefore, although uh, one would want the um, uh, uh, flexibility to update uh, each of the codes. Uh, you know, as, as if you like, almost as annex is rather than having to change the whole cabinet manual every time someone wanted to make a, a, a change. I think bringing that together into the cabinet manual is essentially the repository of the rules of government uh, would be would have been. Uh, uh, it was a project I wanted to make a make a start on, um, um, but uh, yeah, as you know, it was crowded out by other events. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Margaret Beckett. When we have these conversations, we all tend to talk as if there's a kind of seamless web of regulation, um, which is consistent uh, right across the piece. But in fact, of course, we have a, a somewhat fairy system. We have some elements of regulation which are very independent, and we have other areas which are somewhat advisory. You were just talking a moment ago about the flexibility that you thought um, was beneficial in, in a system of convention rather than just codification. Is it a strength of our system that we've got these variations or is it a weakness? I think it, it probably overall it's a strength, but in particular areas it can be a weakness and there are areas I think um, uh, it, it, we should consider whether we have the, that boundary between independence and advisory. Um, uh, uh, Dame Morrow, as you, as, as you described it, in exactly the right place. And, uh, and I know you took evidence from Alex Allen in an earlier session, who was talking about his role. Uh, and it seems to me that if one looks at areas like the ministerial code, where I think the convention that fundamentally the decision has to rest with the prime minister as the sovereign's principal advisor on who to have within a government, um, uh, uh, and indeed um, what um, disciplinary measures or conduct measures need to be applied, um, I think there is a distinction between the independence of an, uh, the potential independence of an investigation, just getting at the facts of any particular um, uh, issue, and then um, the degree to which any uh, intervention by a professional is essentially advisory to a democratically elected uh, leader on what um, um, uh, decision to take as a result of that. And so I think sometimes these issues can become a bit confused, and I would generally favour um, independence um, and indeed independent um, initiative in areas of establishing the facts and scrutiny, whilst recognising that actually the final decisions need to remain within the 
uh, political system. You made it plain already in, in your earlier evidence that you think on the whole our system of regulation is strong. Well, that's what I've taken you to be saying. Um, but is, is there, you said, yes, it's a good thing to have some variation, but in some elements of our um, advisory system of regulation, like say ACABA, where there doesn't seem to be any enforcement procedure, do you think that's going too far? Do you think that's kind of falling off the scale? Is that something we need to look at? Yes, I think it is, because uh, I think in any system of regulation, I think back to my time at the Home Office, uh, where, of course, we were dealing with a whole range of issues of compliance across the whole of society, there is always the risk that um, uh, government in imposing rules, regulations, uh, obligations, etc., essentially imposes burdens on the compliant um, and um, uh, doesn't really um, uh, properly uh, target the non the, those who are deliberately non-compliant, and I think you could apply that to many of the issues that uh, we are discussing. So the the, the business appointments process. I think Acoba would want to remind us that these rules are owned by government, owned by the cabinet office, and the committee uh, performs an advisory role to the cabinet office and the prime minister uh, on business appointments, rather than actually uh, 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 having the the executive authority, if you like, over them themselves. So there's an independent element, but it is advisory that. Um, those business appointment rules can in some cases um, be uh, uh, impede what we want to see, which is more ventilation of between uh, civil service and indeed public service more generally in the private sector. We often say we need to bring in more expertise from outside. We want more civil servants to have exposure to business and so on. Actually, that can impose frictions in that process. Obviously, it's really important that it's transparent and uh, for you know, the, the, the conflicts of interest are avoided but but just the system itself can impose some frictions in that process uh, and as you said people just say well I'm not going to comply with it at all and I'll deal with the consequences then essentially they can they can make that choice and then that's of course partly a question for the political tier of our system to determine whether um, uh, there should be more robust action taken in those circumstances so I think um, uh, uh, to, to, to use that example, um, it, it is important that we don't simply impose burdens on the instinctively compliant that actually um, are uh, essentially um, uh, sort of be more red tape, whether it's around an individual or an institution, um, and really find ways of targeting those people who, uh, for whom there is a, you know, about, about whom or behaviour about which there's a genuine concern when it comes to a conflict of interest or um, uh, use of information or whatever, whatever it might be, and I think I think all those procedures uh, should be under constant examination um, uh, uh, through that lens. And just briefly and finally, uh, I, you've made plain already that codifying things or writing them down, not not having just conventions, doesn't protect you necessarily. But does it make it somewhat where, for example, there is um, there's a, a points of procedure in the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act. Does it make it easier, though, to ensure uh, that there's a good system? Uh, yes, Denmark. I think it does. I mean, of course, you know, I'm not. I'm not at all. I, I don't think it's binary. So, so I was. I mean, I was obviously in, in the time available trying to make the point about the balance between conventions and rules. But of course, a lot of this needs to be written down. And uh, uh, you, you, one of the paradoxes of an unwritten constitution is it's written down in an awful lot of places and probably at greater length than it would be in a codified single written constitutional document of the kind that other countries have. And you're very familiar with that. It's written in all sorts of places. So I don't think it's a question of um, uh, uh, whether the rules and so on are written down. The point I was just trying to make is even if you have very precise, elaborate rules, you still require essentially um, a, 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 an expectation, a series of conventions about behaviour that uh, ensure that those rules are uh, are, are, are properly applied. The rules themselves are, are, are sufficient, uh, are necessary, but not sufficient to ensure that we have a high ethical standard and good conduct in our system. I suppose that's the point I was trying to make. Thank you. I wonder whether we could go to Dame Shirley Pierce now to talk a little bit further about the ministerial code. So I'll hand over to Shirley. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Lord Sarah, can I just pick up a bit more about the ministerial code which you've touched on now a couple of times um, I mean how successful do you think the current arrangements for it are do you see 
the, and you're talking about um, it being advice and the advice should be taken or not by the politician, but it's their decision. Do you think the way it's set up at the moment is successful or would you see the recent events as demonstrating that it is an unsuccessful uh, way of uh, providing that um, objectivity and advice? Uh, thanks, James Shirley. I think it is mostly successful. Um, and those who've been ministers will know that, um, uh, that, that, um, that the fact of the ministerial code is a part of the incentive to uh, good behaviour um, within government. Now, of course, traditionally, much of our focus, much of the focus of this uh, uh, committee's, uh, at least in, uh, predecessors, would have been on questions of conflict of interest. Uh, and, and much of that was, re uh, uh, it was questions of that kind that really um, um, propelled some of the original work on the, uh, the Nolan Inquiry, the Nolan Principles and so on. Latterly, uh, there's been more of a focus on behaviour, personal conduct towards each other, towards colleagues, between ministers, civil servants, special advisors, um, uh, and so on. Uh, and so the Ministerial Code, um, which was originally not really written uh, designed to, to deal with that set of issues. I don't think it was even ex particularly explicit in, in some of the earlier um, versions of it. Uh, undoubtedly needs to be updated to ensure that those issues on which there are now higher levels of expectation are properly encompassed, just as the Civil Service Code, etc. are, and uh, issues of tackling bullying, harassment, discrimination, etc. within government, of course, have come right up the agenda within all management systems, not just the codes uh, not just the codes themselves, but in all of our processes, and, and, uh, and, and rightly so. So I think the ministerial codes are, uh, ministerial code, sorry, is an important um, uh, um, uh, uh, reference point um, for ministers. But in the end, fundamentally, it is, it is still really boils down to telling ministers to um, apply those underlying principles of you know, avoid conflicts of interest, behave properly, Etc., which are just the same as the principles that we would apply to uh, to to anyone uh, 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 anyone else. And of course, there are examples where uh, um, uh, it, it uh, needs to be updated, or the mechanisms around it probably need to be reformed. So, as part of that updating the content and the mechanisms ar around it, do you? What is your view about the, independent, the advisor being able to initiate and publish their own investigations? Well, so, I, uh, I mean, investigations, of course, are normally uh, published. I think, I mean, there are some complexities in that. Um, if I think of almost any inquiry, for example, into uh, within within a within an organisation, I'm thinking here just of the civil service to use the just to just to use a, an, an analogy. Um, if you're investigating, for example, complaints of behaviour, bullying, uh, harassment, discrimination, and so on, it is often the case that um, uh, some of the potential witnesses want their evidence to be held. Uh, uh, at least anonymously and in confidence. And you have to respect their, their individual right to maintain that confidence. And if you don't, of course, people might not come forward. So you have to handle these things sensitively. And so uh, while, uh, um, therefore, I think the principle, that publication of at least the findings of an inquiry um, uh, is, is sound, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the entire evidential trail of an inquiry should be published because you uh, you might actually paradoxically have a chilling effect on the willingness of people to come forward and uh, and, and bring uh, and bring evidence. And of course, we've seen uh, uh, how that can cause uh, uh, difficulties in, in other uh, recent examples. I do think uh, with the independent advisor, the, the the point I was making, I think, in response to one of Dame Margaret's questions, is I think we need to draw a clearer distinction, perhaps between uh, the, uh, the independence of the investigation, essentially just getting at the facts and understanding what's happened and has there been a breach of uh, conduct or behaviour or whatever, uh, and thus a breach of the ministerial code. And just essentially that, uh, uh, that judgment, um, fact-based, evidence-based judgment of whether there's been a breach. And we need to make a clear distinction between that and then the decision that rests in the end with the prime minister about what the appropriate action might be if that sanctions and so on. And I think, and I've said this before, in, including to, to, to PACAC, um, that uh, the, the, the convention, which of course isn't actually a real convention, but has sort of grown up in public and political expectation, that any breach of the ministerial code um, requires resignation 
is not a convention that we apply in other uh, circumstances. You have a range of sanctions from behavioral coaching through to informal warnings, through to formal warnings, final written warnings, and of course, eventually dismissal, but a range of, of, of interventions uh, that you can apply in other employment situations, by the way, in the private sector, as well as in uh, civil and public service. And I don't think, uh, notwithstanding the slightly unusual nature, unique nature of ministerial engagement, I don't think that um, uh, ministers should be subject to essentially a binary choice any more than, uh, than others. And the fact of that binary choice or that expectation of the binary choice, you've breached, therefore, resignation, of course, can then skew back into the uh, issue of the establishing whether there was a breach in the first place. And so I think a clearer distinction between those two things would be healthy. And then, final point, I know it's quite a long answer, but I know it's a really important issue for you. Um, then, of course, um, the Prime Minister's decision on the appropriate intervention, sanction, behaviour intervention, whatever, would be subject to uh, parliamentary scrutiny in, in the normal uh, way. And I think that that balance would be a healthier one. So if I'm just to check, I'm understanding you correctly, you would be in favour of graduated sanctions for um, failure yes. to comply with the ministerial code, but you would not be in favour of the independent advisor determining those sanctions, or you would... No, I think that would be wrong. So I think the, I think, uh, I think we, we need to, I mean, actually, as, as we do within, um, with, with, within most organisations, and certainly within the civil service, you have a process to establish what happened. Is there a case to answer? Was there a, was there a case of bullying? Is it a vexatious complaint, et cetera, et cetera? And I think it is important that that process of essentially getting at the facts, um, the investigative process, is uh, separate from the, the, the executive decisions on what actions are appropriate. Uh, by maintaining the, that independent, I mean, essentially, you know, the, the, uh, you know, there are parallels in our, in our criminal justice system, of course, between uh, the decision as to whether something has happened and the decision as, the decision as to what the appropriate sanction is, if, in, in, if indeed the, the, case is, the case is made. And that underlying principle, I think, is the right, is the right one, and we should apply it in these areas. I think some of the, the controversy that's arisen has arisen because that distinction is not clear enough. And you said that the Prime Minister was then accountable to Parliament for the decision that he or she had made. And how, how does that work? And that's kind of well, question. I mean, of course, in a sense, that goes to, that goes to parliamentary scrutiny. I mean, uh, you know, people can argue about whether um, you know, Prime Ministers in a minority government versus Prime Ministers with a big majority, et cetera, are more or less accountable. But fundamentally, that is a job of Parliament. And Parliament needs to uh, impose transparency and scrutiny and then accountability, of course, on... Uh, the Prime Minister for that decision, as, as for other decisions a Prime, Minister, uh, a Prime Minister takes. But I think we would be in a healthier place if there were a clear, independent process to establish what's happened, and then the Prime Minister, of course with the advice of the Cabinet Secretary and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 other advice if necessary, says, I've accepted um, the evidence of the investigation, um, I, uh, I, I, I now have a clear view as to you know, what happened in this particular case, and I have decided the appropriate uh, intervention, not necessarily sanction, um, is X, Y, or Z. And of course, they would then be held accountable for that in Parliament and um, have to justify it publicly. And that, of course, is the essence of a democratic, of democratic scrutiny. Okay, Lord Sedwell, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just follow up just one other point? So you are saying in terms of the establishing the facts that the initiative should for that, which currently rests with the Prime Minister, would better rest with the independent uh, advisor or a similar role, uh, rather than having to be triggered by the Prime Minister, although the decision on the facts on, on what to do about it would rest with the Prime Minister? Yes, well, I think I think there must be a presumption. I mean, however it is organised, just as there would be with a bullying complaint in the organisations that you and I have run, there must be a presumption that if, if a complaint is brought forward and it's a of any kind, whether it's about personal conduct or conflict of interest or inappropriate behaviour, whatever it might be, you know, as long as it is clear that there is evidence and a case to answer, that that should be properly investigated. That, that must be the presumption. Um, and that should be separate from the decision about what, um, what action 
is taken should that investigation um, demonstrate that that you know, the 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 accusation or or some variant of it um, was well founded. Thank you very much, Manisha Shah. Thank you. Good morning, Lord Sarwell. Um, Good morning. May I, uh, uh, talking a little bit more about uh, this process or the difference between an informal course of action and a formal course of action. So you you gave some evidence to PACAC, um, I think it was a year, a year ago, March 2020, where in response to a question that you were asked on a course of action, if somebody questioned the conduct of a minister or a special advisor or an official, you said that you you can you tend it towards a mostly informal process mm -hmm. and that you only really invoked a formal process in the most serious of issues where the informal processes had failed to to give you a a, a reasonable outcome uh, uh, what would you say is the role of a code of conduct within that informal process how often for example do you did you evoke the relevant code whatever it might have been the ministerial code or the special advisors code in your informal interventions um, i think uh, thank you um uh, one one would probably refer to those but not necessarily saying well you in paragraph four this is what it says it, one would tend to have a conversation where we say, look, you don't forget, this is broadly speaking what the code says, um, and you are obliged to follow it. And, and this is, a, I mean, you, you've all worked in, in, um, in, in organisations of, of complexity and of different sizes. Of course, most people, most of the time, are not seeking to behave badly. I mean, you know, there are very, very few rotten ap apples in any, in any barrel. And, and usually, and government is, a, is, a, is often an example of this, if people do behave badly towards each other, and I'm not thinking here about conflict of interest issues, I'm thinking here just of personal, uh, personal behaviour, um, it is usually because an otherwise um, uh, uh, um, sensible individual has, for whatever reason, personal, professional, work, whatever, come under severe stress, and a sort of, and it, and a kind of, it, it's, it's, uh, that is causing uh, inappropriate uh, behavior and so if you can tackle it early enough and this is true within the civil service and between civil servants as much as between the different uh, categories if you can if you can tackle it early enough you can identify what the, what the underlying problem is and tackle that um, and it's often the case that people um, uh, start to behave badly because they become under stress because something in their professional and something in their personal lives um, is going awry at the same time, and people can often handle one or the other, but both at the same time is you know, is is, uh, 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 is more challenging. And so, usually, the right answer, if you can tackle it early enough, is um, some kind of coaching or managerial intervention. Now, of course, if it manifests itself as inappropriate behaviour, um, harassment, bullying, etc., then you have to sanction it. Um, not um, uh, necessarily because the individual themselves. Um, isn't just operating under stress or whatever, because you have to um, uh, 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 demonstrate integrity in the system that you simply will not tolerate this kind of uh, this kind of behaviour. But um, any any leader in any organisation is generally seeking to identify where the pressures and stresses arise and intervene early if they see people uh, beginning to uh, um, uh, behave in um, uh, in ways which adversely affect um, their colleagues and. and the point I was making, though, is it's only in rare cases is that, um, uh, particularly in, a, in an organisation which has a very high sense of ethics and a very high sense of conduct, like the civil service, for example, it's only in rare cases that you see essentially deliberately bullying, deliberately harassing, deliberately discriminatory behaviour. Of course, you have to crack down hard when you see that, even if it's inadvertent. Um, but most of the time, you're trying to help people I mean, to use a, 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 a rather trite phrase, be the best they, they, they can, uh, behave appropriately to their colleagues, intervene early, uh, use coaching and other interventions to try and ensure that any inadvertent uh, behaviours are corrected. If I may just, sorry, uh, just just uh, just probe a little bit on that. I mean, I, I accept uh, the rationale behind it, but in terms of specifically using the code, did you, in fact evoke 
the relevant code in those informal discussions? Do they, do the codes set an expectation uh, that can be used? Are they helpful? Do you rely on them? I think the fact that they are there, it goes to Dame Margaret's point earlier, the fact that they are there and you can just mention them is an important part of the conversation. So if I think of my you know, role as the permanent secretary at the Home Office, if I had to have the kind of conversation you're referring to with a special advisor or, or a junior minister, for example, or, you know, uh, um, or I mean, as well as a civil servant, then in that conversation, I might well, particularly if they, if they don't just simply accept the first intervention, which is me saying to them, come on, uh, that was out of order. Uh, you, you owe that person an apology. And you've really got to handle yourself better in future. You know, that kind of, you know, that's the kind of, initial intervention one might want to make. But if there's some sort of um, resistance to that, then one might well say, well, look, let's not get into the position where I have, I think I, I can record a conversation where I actually said, you really don't want this conversation to head in the direction where I'm starting to talk about the relevant code. Um, uh, uh, you know, so essentially one's using it as a, as a potential escalation of what otherwise should be a um, a, a, an amicable but but pointed coaching conversation, and then of course if yeah, if, if if they persist, then you've got to go that route. Thank you, Lord Sedwell. I mean, I'm mindful of your time, so I, I know there uh, that Andrew has a few questions, so I will leave it there. But thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Lord Stonnell. Uh, good morning, Lord Sedwell. Uh, you, good you morning, <laughs> You've, you've painted a very uh, benign picture of the uh, climate that exists in Whitehall and uh, in Number 10 uh, and the, the, the calm chat, up, chat line and so on. Um, so in that context, how successful has the Special Advisors Code of contact, Conduct been in uh, regulating uh, their behaviour and their relationship with both civil services and uh, the outside world? Well, I'm not sure I have painted a benign picture. I mean, government is a government is a high octane, high tension environment, and um, uh, uh, you, one of the things one is often doing is just trying to make sure that people are behaving well towards each other in that environment under under huge uh, stress. I suppose what I'm trying to do is just put it into uh, into into context, because of course only rarely do examples break into the public domain, and most of the time, as um, relationships are professionally conducted as they are in most institutions that of course doesn't make the news and, it, and, and isn't reported and I'm just trying to remind ourselves you've all operated in this environment that most of the time relationships are conducted professionally and with courtesy and uh, and so on. Um, I, I mean special advisors um, I think uh, it's, it's a mixed picture to be honest um, and some of that is because we don't really um, you know, special advisors are often much less experienced um, than ministers. Um, they're in uh, highly insecure uh, jobs. Um, uh, they've you know, come in from you know, whatever, whatever background they have, and they've been given positions sometimes of um, uh, uh, very significant uh, 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 influence in, in, in all departments. And so um, I don't actually think we apply something we, we work, we actually did do some work on in my time in, in the cabinet's office. We don't actually have a proper human resources system around special advisors. Uh, we don't really induct, or we didn't, um, induct them properly, manage them properly, um, help them understand um, uh, uh, their responsibilities, um, given the prominence and influence of their role, but also their, you know, their rights as well. If your line manager is the Secretary of State who has a load of other preoccupations and you know, there's a generation gap between you and your entire future is dependent upon the favour of that Secretary of State. Um, that isn't necessarily um, the set of criteria you know, most of us would look for in our immediate line manager, whom, whom we're hoping is trying to coach us uh, and help us learn the ropes of a, uh, of, a, of a new institution. And that isn't what we do to people, you know, graduate trainees, which in effect some of these people are, coming into most other organisations. So actually one of the things we've we sought to do, and my... Uh, my deputy when I was cabinet secretary, Helen McNamara, did a great deal of work on this. It was actually um, complement the code and essentially, the, you know, if you like, the stick of the code with um, the carrots of much better HR management around special advisors. And that's, a, that's, that, that's 
you know, an embryonic process, but I think it's the right, uh, that blend is the right approach. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think you've really, in a way, preempted uh, the way I was going to go because quite clearly special advisors have very much less experience and less understanding of the basic culture of both the civil service and maybe government and some are graduates uh, starting out in life, but some also have got uh, experience in rather more robust areas of uh, work and performance. Um, do you think that the responsibility for implementing the code of conduct uh, should rest with ministers who've got plenty else on their plate and how exactly should they be, uh, if you like, brought under the umbrella of regulation? Should SPADs be subject to more independent outside regulation? I think, I think SPADs, act, I mean, in practice, and again, the former ministers here um, uh, uh, will, will be familiar with this. In practice, actually, um, the permanent secretary of the department concerned has uh, a, a considerable role in the oversight, regulation, and if necessary, intervention into the behaviour of special advisors. And that, of course, can go from everything from a quiet chat with the special advisors concerned, just to uh, you know, both, if, if you're doing it well, to, to help coach them and understand their role and perform their roles effectively, uh, but also to um, check them if they're uh, going off track. And if it, you know, obviously, if it isn't, uh, if it's going awry, then you have to, as, as you know, I can think of occasions when I did, you have to go behind closed doors with the Secretary of State and say, right, we have an issue here and we need to tackle it. And I'm sure most permanent secretaries would be able to give you that kind of example. So although the formal regulation of, of SPADs rests with ministers, in practice, um, uh, the, the permanent secretary of the departments concerned actually play a very big part in um, uh, managing um, the, the way special advisors interact with the rest uh, of the department. And of course, they... They do have their own uh, management chain now um, uh, uh, as well. But many special advisors, or some, let's say some special advisors, uh, put themselves in a very assertive position in relation to civil servants and perhaps rather dismissive of the, of the words which are, are brought to them in such a, um, an informal way. Um, I mean, have ethics been subsumed in pursuing political objectives and are not special advisors in poll position in achieving that within a department? How does that tension fit in with the pattern and picture you've just painted? Well, special advisors are in the end the agent of their minister. Uh, I mean, they're appointed by the prime minister, uh, but of course um, uh, work directly for their secretary of state or the minister concerned, and therefore their authority rests on their relationship with their minister and whether um, uh, civil servants or indeed anyone else around them believes that that individual is speaking authoritatively um, with the confidence uh, of their minister. And if their behaviour uh, becomes out of line, then of course in the end the minister um, is responsible for that too. And as I said, as permanent secretary, there are occasions when I had to, um, uh, uh, when, when sort of direct representation didn't appear adequate and I had to raise behaviour with the uh, minister concerned, and I'm sure most permanent secretaries would think of similar examples. And of course, there are um, uh, quite public examples of special advisors who got it wrong, um, and I can think of some in my time, and had to resign as a uh, result. And uh, you know, that's, an, that's uh, a, a, a traumatic experience, of course, for the individual's concern. So you would be not in favour of making any changes to the existing arrangements and the lines of responsibility or bringing the special advisors code of conduct into a more regulated framework or. Uh, you see no, I didn't, say, I, I didn't say I didn't say I wouldn't make any changes, but um, uh, uh, I mean, special advisors are, are essentially regulated as temporary civil servants. Um, and I think um, uh, uh, it may it may. It may well, in some circumstances, prove necessary to bring them more formally, for example, under the, uh, uh, the conduct remit of the permanent secretary uh, concerned. But in practice, I think that is generally uh, how this applies. So I'm not saying no changes. I'm, I'm perfectly open to change um, in, uh, uh, in the way that those codes are applied, just as we should always um, be, be um, examining the codes to see how effective they are. But whether there should be a wholesale shift to treat special advisors as a completely different category, 
um, subject to a different kind of regulation. I'm skeptical. I don't know that that is necessary. And I think fundamentally, the principle that they are accountable, you know, that they are they are representatives of the ministers, and the ministers have the accountabilities we've discussed. I think that underlying principle uh, is an important one. Yes, but uh, if I could just finish up by saying, uh, as cabinet secretary, you were in a good position to recommend any changes that you thought should be made, and I'm wondering whether. Uh, you ever did or whether you would be thinking now that you should have done? Well, I've always maintained um, as one of my ethical principles, the code of um, confidentiality about things that the, the cabinet secretary remind, uh, oh, um, uh, advises the prime minister. Uh, no, no that, and that, but that is an important point and it's an important principle of governance. Um, but of course, when we look at um, the code, the special advisors and the ministerial code, for example, with a change of uh, prime minister, um, we will uh, make recommendations to the Prime Minister about updates we think are necessary, changes we think would be wise, uh, etc. And then, of course, the Prime Minister decides whether or not um, they wish to uh, incorporate those. And that's, a, that's an ongoing process. And, and the codes, as you know, have changed uh, sometimes substantially, sometimes uh, marginally, uh, many times over the years. Thank you very much. Lord Seville, thank you very much indeed for your time. And on behalf of the committee, thank you for coming to give evidence this morning. Thank you very much. Lord Evans, thank you very much. Thanks to the committee. Good to see uh, 